you go ahead and take your Bibles and join me in Galatians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 10 through 12, but just remain seated for a moment. Galatians 1, 10 through 12. I want to ask you a question. When you were a student, elementary school, junior high, I guess you have junior high now, right? It's middle school, high school. You probably didn't. Did you ever take home a bad grade? Did you ever have to carry home a test paper that had more red ink on it than correct answers? You remember report cards? You'd, you'd take your report card home and you hand it over to your parents. And of course, all the grades were there. And if the grades weren't bad enough, and I understand, I'm probably telling on myself here, if the grades weren't bad enough, there was this box on the back of it for teacher comments, you know, and they always put something in there like, Mike doesn't pay attention. Mike talks too much. You never had that, did you? You never had to deal with anything like that, did you? Hand my parents that report card or that test, and there's a question they would always ask. Why? Why are you failing English? And if you read my daily post, you can tell I did not pass English. Why have you got a failing grade in math? Why did you fail the spelling test? Why? Why are you not doing better? Well, if you were like me, a very common ploy that I had was to blame it on the teacher. My teacher hates me, that's what it is. Or this one. Well, you know what? She didn't tell us we were having a test until she handed it out. I didn't even know I had to study for it. Or, you know what? She really doesn't do a good job explaining it. Why don't you ask questions? I do ask questions. She just, she can't explain it. It's the teacher's fault, right? A, a very common ploy is to get the focus off of me and on to their failure. The problem is not me. The problem is the teacher. They're not communicating well. They're not teaching the class well. It's not my fault. It's the teachers. Undermining a teacher is a good way of being able to get out of bad grades, or, or at least I thought it was. You teachers in here, did y'all ever hear of that being done to you? It's your fault. Your fault. It's also a tactic used by many to undermine the gospel. If you can undermine the teacher, if you can undermine the preacher, you call in question the message. If somehow you can prove that there's something wrong with the teacher, there, there's something wrong with the one who communicates the message, then you can discredit the message itself. That's what the Judaizers, or one of the ploys the Judaizers are doing to Paul in the churches of Galatia. They are trying to undermine the gospel. They are trying to undermine the message that he preached by calling into question him. They, they want to they make some charges against him that he's a man pleaser, he's a second-hand apostle, he's not, he's not one of the original 12, you know. Um, he, he wasn't with the original 12. That's a pretty good ploy, though, is it not? Paul was not one of the original 12. In fact, he wasn't even Judas's replacement, Right? In fact, if you go back far enough, and these people know this, 
he was a hater of the church. He was a persecutor of the church. He was trying to destroy the church. I mean, he come in way after the apostles were established. He's not part of them. He tried destroying them. If you can discredit the messenger, you can hopefully, or this is their thinking, discredit the message. There's something wrong with him. He's not really one of the apostles. Therefore, his message is not true. His message is not accurate. And so Paul begins here in verse 10 and really goes, goes through uh, chapter 2 defending his apostleship. This is something Paul didn't like to do because Paul didn't want the, the attention to be on Paul. Paul wants the attention to be on Christ. But he also understands the ploy here. He also understands that if the Judaizers can call into question his integrity or his authority or even his apostleship, that that can shed a poor light on the gospel itself. And so even though he doesn't want to, he does defend his apostleship. And so that's what we're going to start looking at this morning. If you will, go ahead and stand with me as we read Galatians 1, verses 10 through 12 this morning. Galatians 1, verse 10, Paul says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. For I would, I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer together. Fathers, we come to your word. Lord, we are those who do believe that Paul was an apostle. We do believe that he was called by you, commissioned by you. We do believe that Paul wrote these letters, this letter in particular that we are studying. We also believe that he wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Our prayer this morning, Father, is that you would grant us a, a better understanding, a greater assurance of, of your word, uh, not necessarily of the Apostle Paul, but of your work your work in and through him so that we have a greater trust and a greater faith in you. We ask that you'd lead us at this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So Paul is going to begin, you may be seated, Paul is going to begin to defend his ministry here. And we're going to start, uh, we're going to look at verse 10 and, and start under the thought that right here Paul is providing them his motive. He's going to point out to them his motive in serving Christ. Notice he starts off by saying, for now am I seeking the favor of men or of God or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, he says, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He begins by pointing out the fact he is a bondservant of of Christ. One of the charges that the Judaizers were making against Paul is that he was a man pleaser. They were telling the churches in Galatia that Paul himself was a man pleaser. And so Paul wants to sort of draw their attention to his motive. There are a lot of motives that men have for being in the pulpit. There are a lot of motives that men have for becoming a pastor or preacher. Some of them you can tell right off the bat, they, these are impure motives. There are some who honestly believe that they're going to make a lot of money in the ministry. 
See, they see the mega church pastors. They see the celebrity pastors. And they're thinking, that's a good way to make money right there. I have a pastor friend who was discipling a young man in his church. This young man seemed so eager to learn, so eager to do the things that he was doing. He would go on hospital visits with him. He would go on home visits with him. He would come by when he was in his study and, and just kind of ask him, all right, how, do you, how are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And, and got him to teach his method of studying him in sermon preparation. He demonstrated a great interest in the pastorate. And so my friend is thinking, this young man... God must be leading him to be a pastor. One day he come by and he said, I, I need to talk to you. And he said, I, I think I want to go into the ministry. My friend said, that, that is great. That is great. What is, what is leading you into the ministry? And he said, well, you know, I've been watching you. I've been, been, been watching the things you do. And, and I think I can do all those things. And I think I can do them better. And I think I can make a lot of money at this. That's an improper motive for being a preacher. There are some who want to be the pastor or the preacher because they think it's an ultimate position of authority. Well, that, that's a misunderstanding of the pastor to begin with. It, it's, a, it's a servant. It's a servant's position. Uh, an elder is a servant of the church, seeking to serve Christ, serving the church. But, but they see it as a, as a power position. Or, well, look, everybody's looking at me this morning. That's where they want to be. They want all the attention on them. And again, that's an improper motive. They don't want the attention on me. We want the attention on Christ. If a, if a preacher is failing to point his congregation to Christ, if, if you're seeing the man in the pulpit, then... There's a failure right here. There are some motives, too, that we would think are good motives that are improper motives. There are those that want to see the church grow. And so they want to be a pastor to help the church grow. The problem with that is you'll begin to compromise if that's your only focus. If your focus is solely to get people in the pews. Keep people in the pews. You'll be willing to compromise. You'll be willing to soften the message so that you don't anger the individuals in the church. Paul points us to what I would say is the motive for pastoring. The motive for ministry, whether you're a pastor, Sunday school teacher, uh, a lay preacher, or whether you're a Christian out in the world, the motive is because you're a bondservant of Christ. Paul says, I am a bondservant of Christ. The charge against Paul by the Judaizers would have been, again, that he's a people pleaser, a people pleaser, that he had changed the message. He had changed the gospel to make it more palatable to the Gentiles. They would have said, Paul has taken the gospel message, the message of salvation, and he has removed the difficult standards so that the Gentiles can be a part of the kingdom. He's removed the law. He said, you don't, you're not accountable to the law, you're accountable to Christ, and that made it a lot easier. He has moved, removed the ceremonial law. He, he has told them, you don't have to be at the temple at this time, and, and you don't have to observe these feasts and these moons and these things and those things. You don't have to do all that for salvation. They're saying he's removed all the difficulties, and they're saying he's even removed circumcision, a sign of the covenant. He has done away with the difficult things of the gospel in order to make the Gentiles, in order to make it more acceptable to the Gentiles. You know, really, being a man pleaser, though, is a pretty easy trap to fall into. 
there are very few people that do not want to be liked. They might not necessarily want to be liked by everybody, but there are very few people that do not want to be liked. There are very few people that want to be the target of everybody else's scorn and criticism and, and hatred. People in positions of, of, of authority or people in positions in which they have to lead people and guide people are no different. Sometimes you're faced with difficult decisions. You're presented with difficult choices and sometimes the best choice Sometimes the right thing to do is not always the most popular choice. And a people pleaser can't always make the right choice. Because he understands that choice will anger many. And look, here's the difficulty a lot of people pleasers have. It might not anger many, but it might anger the influential ones. You can get into churches. I've got pastor friends who have had this situation. Most churches have one, two, three main contributors. If there's something going on, these individuals are going to give, and they're going to they're going to give in a good way. And you got to keep them happy. That's the mindset. If we want them to keep giving, we've got to keep them happy. And so there are individuals that will not make the right choice because it'll alienate the influential people. Bill Cosby was once asked the secret to success, and this is his reply. I don't know the secret to success, but I do know the secret to failure. Try to please everyone. That's a people pleaser's mindset. To please everyone. I want to read you a transcript. Some of you may be familiar with this, but this is where you get to if in the ministry you try to be a people pleaser. Okay? If your focus is specifically on the people, and look, you've got to love the people, you've got to care for the people, you've got to minister. That's why we're here, to minister to people. But if that is your focus, is just to, just to please the people, this is where you get to. You may be familiar with this. I'm not even going to say the name of this individual. I'll tell you who one of them is. One of them is Larry King, okay? I'm not going to tell you the pastor that he's interviewing. You might know, though, as we go through. In this interview, Larry King says, you don't think if people don't believe as you believe, they're somehow condemned? Now, let me say this right now. When it comes to Jesus Christ being the only way to heaven, I do believe if you don't believe that, you're condemned. I believe you believe that. So there's this question, pastor. That hurt. You know... I think that happens in our society, but I try not to do that. I tell people all the time, preached a couple Sundays about it. I'm for everybody. You may not agree with me, but to me it's not my job to try to, to, try to straighten everybody out. The gospel is called the good news. My message is a message of hope that God's for you. You can live a good life no matter what's happened to you, and so I don't know. I know there is condemnation, but I don't feel that's my place. King, you've been criticized for that, haven't you? I have. I have because I don't know. Later in the interview, I, I don't know. Uh, there's probably a balance between I believe you have to know Christ, but I think if you know Christ, if you're a believer in God, you're going to have some good works. 
I think it's a cop-out to say I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything. King, what if you're Jewish or Muslim and you don't accept Christ at all? You know, I'm very careful about saying who would and wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. King, if you believe you have to believe in Christ, they're wrong, aren't they? Let me answer. Yes, they are. His answer. Well, I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I believe here's what the Bible teaches, and from a Christian faith, that's what I believe. But I just think that only God will judge a person's heart. Um, I spent a lot of time in India with my father. I, I don't know about all their religion, but I know they love God. And I don't know. I've seen them, their sincerity, so I, I don't know. I know for me and what the Bible teaches, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. King, how about issues that the church has feelings about? Feelings about? <laughs> Abortion, same-sex marriages. Yeah, you know what, Larry? I don't go there. I just, king. You have thoughts, though. Well, I have thoughts. I just, you know, I just think that a same-sex marriage is the way, isn't the way God intended it to be. I, I don't think abortion is the best. I, I think there are other, you know, a better way to live your life. But I'm not going to condemn those people. I tell them all the time, our church is open for everybody. King, you don't call them sinners? I don't. Problem there. King, is that a word you don't use? I, I don't use it. I never thought about it, but I probably don't. You know, most people already know that what they're doing is wrong. When I get them to church, I want to tell them that you can change. There can be a difference in your life, so I don't go around down the road condemning. King, do you believe in the Bible literally? I do. I do. After everything he just said, he don't. He don't. But that's where trying to be a people pleaser gets you in the ministry. When you're asked a tough question, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and label it a tough question in our society. Your answer has to be, I don't know. But we do know. We do know. We've been told. The problem is, if we're going to please men, we have to soften the gospel. And that's the, that's the charge that the Judaizers have made against Paul, is that Paul has softened the gospel message. Paul has made it easier for Gentiles to get in to salvation, to get into the kingdom. Man-pleasers are willing to compromise the truth. They're willing to compromise on right, what, what is right. They're willing to forfeit integrity in order to please people. Paul's response to this charge is to point out to his, his motive. He says at the very end there of verse 10, if I were trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. The word there is doulos. It is a slave. The definition is an individual that is owned by another person. A person whose will is to do the will of another. A person whose entire livelihood is consumed and determined by the one who owns them. Paul's motive in his ministry was to do the will of Christ. 
His motive in ministry, his reason for living, you could say, is to do what Christ had called him to do. And the thing about Paul is Paul was willing, and, and folks, this is where we must be. And I'll go ahead and tell you, this is not easy. Paul was willing to do the will of Christ. He was willing to accomplish the will of Christ regardless of what it cost him personally. Great example of that is in Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas have gone on the first missionary journey and they're in the region of Galatia. They're in this very region. They're in Lystra. And the Jews have stirred up the crowds against him. They have dragged Paul out of the city and they have stoned him. They believed to death. They picked up stones, they stoned him, they believed him to be dead, and they left. Now, folks, I want to ask you a question. What if that were you? Beaten almost to death. What do you do now? What got Paul in this position? What got Paul stoned? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preaching that their only way of salvation was faith through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. No works. That got him stoned. What was Paul's response? Now, he wasn't dead. Clearly we know that. What was his response? Paul got up, went right back into Lystra to begin with, and continued on the missionary journey. That was the first missionary journey. Paul never compromised on the gospel, in, even in the face of death. Look, the threat of being arrested or actually being arrested itself never deterred Paul. Paul continued to preach the gospel. The one thing that got him stoned, the one thing, the one reason why Paul knew what every prison in every town looked like is because he kept preaching the gospel. He would not back off of that motive. That's what drove him. He would not surrender from that. Now, look, Paul was human. You can read the pain in his voice, pain in his words at the end of 2 Timothy when he's talking about everybody forsaking him. He wanted to be liked. He wanted people to love him. You, you can hear, hear the love he has for the church in Thessalonica, and he, he's appreciative of the love they have for him. You can hear him in his letter to, to Corinth. It's like, I love you. Why do you not love me? Why do you not care for me? Paul wanted to be liked. He, he's like you and I. But more than being liked, he wanted to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted to be obedient to Christ. And if being obedient meant not being liked, then Paul was okay with that. Paul writes here in verse 10, as he's describing his medicine, uh, motive, he starts off by saying for, there in verse 10, for. It's the Greek word gar. It means because. It means for. It can mean indeed or certainly. But there's another meaning that this word can have, and it probably fits best right here. For is not a, an inaccurate translation, but probably the best way to translate the word gar there would be there. There. Am I trying to please men now? It's, it's um, I used to hear my mom say this all the time. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. She'd make a point. And she's saying, now put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's kind of what he's saying. Pointing back to verses 8 and 9. You remember what he said in 8 and 9? If any man, 
an angel, if we or anybody else preaches a gospel contrary to what we've already preached to you, he is to be accursed. That word there means uh, determined, devoted to destruction. Paul is saying if anybody preaches a contrary gospel to the uh, gospel contrary to the true gospel, he is to be accursed, he is to be condemned. And now Paul says, there. Does that sound like a man pleaser to you? Would a man pleaser say anything like that? No, a man pleaser wouldn't say that because look, already you're, 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 con you're condemning people. We just heard from one that wasn't willing to condemn people, right? And Paul says, there. You call me a man pleaser, would a, would a man pleaser make that statement? Does that sound like I am trying to make friends to you? Does that sound like I'm trying to make men happy? He's saying, am I compromising on something just to make it more palatable to others? His question for the Galatians is there. Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? When you look at his condemnation there, when you look at his statement, you can, it's very clear. His goal is to please God. His goal is to please Christ. And then he, he makes a statement here that makes it, it's one that needed to be listened to then and now. He says, if I were still trying to please men, notice that he says, if I were still trying to please men. He's pointing back to his former way of life, and, and a former way of life he's going to get into here in a moment. He's admitting that that's exactly what he used to do before he was saved. When he was arresting people, when, when he was dragging them off to prison, look down in verse 13. Verse 13, he says this, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, uh, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. His former way of life. As he's describing this, he's letting them know. My goal, in verse 14 he continues, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen and being extremely zealous, look for what? Extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Ancestral things that men had established. I was more concerned with that. He's like, now I'm not, I'm not seeking to please men anymore. If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He's letting us know right here, the two are incompatible. You cannot be a man pleaser and be a bondservant of Christ. Maybe we should say it this way. You cannot be a bondservant of Christ and be a man pleaser. You cannot please Christ and always please men, especially those outside of the faith. You can't compromise on the gospel to make friends. You cannot, you can't add to the gospel to make friends. And you're saying, well, how would you go about adding to the gospel to make friends? Making a legalistic thing making it a legalistic thing. You, you have to keep all these laws in order to, to, to be in the faith. Paul's point is they're the ones softening the demands. They're the ones distorting the gospel. They're the ones changing from repentance and faith. Paul's motive is to serve Christ. Before we move on, I want to ask you a question. What is your motive? You know a trap we can fall into today? Prove I'm right. Is that really the important thing in an evangelistic discussion with someone to prove we're right? 
Our motive is to exalt Christ. Our motive is to do what Christ has called us to do, to be obedient to him. Paul's saying, look, you, you've heard all this about me. You, you've, heard, you've heard the attacks against me. Let me tell you what my motive is. My motive is to serve Christ regardless of what it costs me. Tough. We can say that. It's easy to say that in here in these four walls. I'll do what Christ has called me to do regardless of what it costs me. Can you do it when the time comes? That's, that's what Paul has proven to us that he did. He served Christ. Paul continues to defend his, apost uh, his apostleship by clarifying his message, though, in verses 11 and 12. He, he focuses a little bit more on the message uh, here at this point because the, a second charge against him would have been against his message. One of the things they, they said was that he had softened it up, that, that he had changed the message to make it more palatable. But another thing they would have said is, again, he's a second-hand apostle. He, he wasn't even one of the original 12, and how do we even know he's one of them, you know? How do we even know he's an apostle? In fact, uh, the message he got, and, and listen, the Judaizers would not have agreed with the original 12, because the original 12 had excluded circumcision too. So they wouldn't have agreed with them, but that's not the point. <laughs> the point is he's not one of them. And if he's not one of them who we disagree with, then he can't be right either. He learned his message from them, and then he watered it down himself. Or it could have been this. Paul's just trying to start his own thing. Paul's just trying to start his own. He's preaching his own gospel. He's, he's formulated this himself. He is the original Joseph Smith. He come up with his own gospel. And so Paul takes a little bit of time here to talk about his message. He starts off by saying in verse 11, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. So he, he's stating right off the bat, it, it didn't originate with man. The gospel did not originate with man. Whether it be the original 12, he said that those 12, they didn't sit down and they didn't come up with the gospel on their own. They didn't formulate their own religion out of this. It's not their gospel. And he's saying, and I didn't sit down and formulate it myself either. It did not originate with men. It's not according to man. Why, is this, why does this matter? Well, because if the gospel is according to man, then man's the, the authority there, and that's as high as it goes. And so now, again, if we can discredit you, if we can discredit the one who preaches the gospel they come up with, then there's absolutely no authority in that gospel to begin with. It's just true for you. It's just true for those like you. And Paul's saying, I'm telling you, it's not according to man. Unlike Islam, unlike Mormonism, and even some within, within Catholicism, parts of it, it did not come from man. It's not according to men. You ever notice the difference in some of these man-made religions, these, these man-centered religions in Christianity? Islam included, Catholicism. One of the things they all focus on is works. Judaism, works. You do, 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 do. You do this, you do this, you do this. Here's the thing, the biggest difference between them and Christianity. They do, we done, right? You must do. And we're saying, no, he done did it, right? We don't do. 
Paul's saying, it didn't originate with me. It didn't originate with man. But he continues on and, and he says, not only did it not originate from man, Paul says, I didn't even learn it from men. Look in verse 12. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. Now, he's saying two different things here. When he says, neither I received it from man, nor was I taught it, he, he's talking about two different things. When, when he says, I never received it, uh, he's talking about a, a common way of learning in those days. The Jews learned by rote memorization. The, the, the goal of the teacher was to get people to memorize. Folks, we do the same thing. I would say most of you don't know your ABCs. And you're saying, wait a minute, I do too. No, you've memorized your ABCs. There's a difference. If I were to ask you what letter comes, stop singing your ABCs, stop. If I were to ask you what letter comes after Q, you would go, Q R A R. You'd sing it. Because you don't know your ABCs. You've memorized your ABCs. Well, letter comes after K. L, right? We have to sing through it. We've memorized. We did the same thing with multiplication tables, didn't we? Two times zero, zero. Two times one is two. Two times two is four. Two times three is six. All right, so what's two times 20? You'd have to go all the way through it. Seen by... Uh, Memorizing is not necessarily learning. It's just a, a rote memorization. You know it, but you have to recall it through, through some kind of mechanism that you've memorized it from. That's the way many of the Jews learned. And that, that, that's why most of them, they know large portions of the Old Testament. They had memorized it. Paul is saying, I didn't memorize anything. No one sat down and went through this with me in an alphabetical order, one, two, three, four, five, six. I, I didn't memorize this as some kind of, of memorization table. It wasn't taught to me. Like, and then he goes on and says, nor was it taught to me. That's interesting because Paul was a very educated man. He was taught by Gamaliel. He was taught Judaism by Gamaliel not the gospel. And we're going to see as we go through the rest of Galatians 1 and 2, he talks about, you know, I went to Jerusalem and I saw Peter, but only for a little while, 15 days. And that was three years later, after his conversion, right? He said, never did I sit down and a man teach me the gospel. The apostles didn't teach him. Ananias, the man who lifted the scales or was used by Christ to lift the scales from his eyes, he didn't teach him. Paul did not learn the gospel from a man. Look down again, Galatians 1, 15 through 18. Paul says this, this is, this is after Paul has been knocked off the horse, he's been blinded and scales are on his eyes, he goes to a street called Straight, Ananias comes, lays his hands on him, the scales fall off, Paul is given his sight. Christ told Ananias, go, he is a chosen instrument of mine. Christ chose Paul. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Then Paul says this in Galatians 1, 15 through 18. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Verse 18, then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem. Paul says, I didn't learn it by rote. I wasn't taught it, but instead I received it by divine revelation. 
That's how he finishes verse 2. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation means a communication of knowledge previously hidden to man by divine or supernatural agency, especially communications that proceed from God or Christ. Paul said, I didn't go to school for this. I didn't go to seminary anywhere. Nobody sat down and taught me. But after I was saved, I, was, I spent time in Arabia and Damascus three years. It's pretty neat here. You know how long Christ spent with his apostles? Roughly three years. Paul received the gospel directly from Christ, from divine revelation. Christ revealed the gospel to him. Here you have a bondservant of Christ with the message of Christ. That's Paul's point. I am his bondservant. I am preaching his message, not man's. So what? What difference does it make? What did it matter then? What does it matter today? Again, the Judaizers are seeking to undermine Paul's ministry. They had distorted the gospel. They had, they had convinced the Galatians that Paul was teaching them a, a false gospel. And they had attacked his message and the, the, his authority. If they were going to believe that Paul had to get their focus back on the true gospel, he had to defend his ministry. Folks, today we live in a day, we live in a world that hates truth and hates authority. If, as you and I believe, this is truth, whose truth? That's what the world's going to want to ask you. Whose truth? Your truth. No. They're going to say, well, it was just Paul. You ever heard that one? That's just Paul saying that. You, you'll hear that especially in attacks uh, from, from those outside the church it, on some kind of doctrine or some kind of way of living. They'll say, Paul said that. That's what Paul said. Christ never said, you hear this so often, especially in the LGBTQ community. Paul, uh, Christ never said anything about same-sex marriage. Well, you know what? Paul was a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he preached that message. And so you and I know, if Paul preached it, Christ said it. That's exactly what we believe. It was Christ, the Holy Spirit, speaking through Paul. So what difference does it make? Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament, folks. If we're going to have confidence that this is the Word of God, we have to know Paul was not a man on his own mission. Paul was not a man who came up with his own gospel, wrote it down, and then got the entire world, not the entire world, but a vast, a good portion of the world to follow after it. We have to be certain, and we are certain, that these words on this page... This letter written to the church in Galatia was inspired by God, spoken through the Apostle Paul, the bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not seeking, we're not seeking to add to the church. We're seeking to glorify him. We're seeking to be, have integrity with his word and let him do with the church as he would do. Let him do with the soul as he would do. Let's trust in him. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we do thank you so much for your word, and we thank you so much for Paul and his ministry. Father, we thank you for the, the example he serves to us, an individual completely given to you. Lord, we live in a day and age that uh, not much different than them, that hate truth, hate Christ. And so, Father, we pray that you'd give us the same motive, the same fortitude that, that Paul had. 
Help our confidence in the message in which he preached, which is your gospel. Help our confidence in it to grow and help us to be faithful in proclaiming it to those around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.